Now this morning's reading comes from John chapter 12, verses 9 to 19. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. The next day, the great crowd that had come from the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realise that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him, <coughs> excuse me, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Do you like butter? I like butter when it's cold. I love putting butter in cheese-like chunks on pieces of bread with peanut butter. Oh, my goodness, it makes my day. But if I was to take um, this Coles Australian butter <laughs> and it put it out on the cement outside on the concrete path on a day where it was 41 degrees uh, Celsius, you know what would happen. Within an hour, it would just uh, be a greasy mess. But on the other hand, if instead of there being butter inside of this particular packet, it was clay, and I put that outside on the footpath, then you and I know that the opposite would be the case. Instead of it melting, it would go hard. Because the same sun that melts the butter hardens the clay. Tell me, why is it one person can hear God's truth and they move towards God and another person hears the same truth and they move away from God? Why is it that it seems that with one person their hearts are soft and melt and yet with another person they are hard just like the clay? And I want to ask you this morning a simple question. How do you know if you are moving towards Jesus? Is it possible that you and I can go to church, be in a small group, be married to a Christian, know our Bible and be still moving away from God? Now, this passage that we have looked at uh, this morning answers those questions. Now come with me and uh, gaze on the faces of the crowd who in euphoria cut down these palm branches, cast them on the road and then almost with gay abandon take off their outer clothes, throw them across the road in front of this little grey donkey that carries the hope of the nation. Can you see etched on their faces radiant hope. Can you hear them crying out with exuberant voices in verse 13? Blessed is the king of Israel. Now this group of enthusiastic Jews reflected in like a small microcosm the desperate hope that they had to want to be liberated from Roman rule. And these Romans who would not hesitate 
to crucify literally 100 to 150 dissidents and line them across a road so that all would know that no one dare stand against them. These Romans had strangled the life out of the Jewish nation, so there was very little joy. And this group who are saying to Jesus as he sits astride a donkey, blessed is the king of Israel, are hoping that this man will give them new hope and ultimately freedom. Now, now why Jesus? Why would they expect Jesus to be such a person? Now, some of the crowd, of course, knew of some of his incredible feats. He'd healed them, possibly sick. Um, maybe some of them had heard how he'd walked on water. Maybe there were some in the crowd who had even been in the gathering in the four or the 5,000 who'd received a free meal from him. But they knew that this Jesus could do incredible things. But wait a minute. Have a look at who is walking beside that little grey docile donkey where Jesus is. Can you see who it is? The text tells us it was Lazarus. And this man, <coughs> whose body had been in the local cemetery for three days, was alive and he's walking with Jesus. And we can never underestimate the impact of this incredible resurrection event on the crowd. And you listen to what verse 17 and 18 says. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. If this Jesus, who could raise people from the dead and do these incredible feats, could do that, maybe, just maybe he could deliver them from the iron fist of Roman rule. And maybe that explains this amazing scene of euphoria of people throwing the branches down in front of Jesus. The, the impact of the resurrection of Lazarus, which we shouldn't underestimate in this scene, it was so great that the religious leaders plotted to assassinate him for he was living proof of the power of Jesus to deliver. But wait a minute, come with me and, and have a look at, at some of the people who were scattered amongst the crowd who are the religious leaders. Um, can, you, can you see their evil eyes of envy? Pilate, for example, knew that it was for envy that he was delivered up to him to be crucified. Can, can you see the, the wrinkles of fear on their face? Because they feared their very existence was being threatened by Jesus. They say in verse 19, the whole world has gone after him. And so what they wanted more than anything else was that they wanted Lazarus dead and they wanted Jesus did. Listen to John 9.10. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. As well as who? As well as Jesus. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Now, this whole scene raises in my mind a question. You see... The religious leaders were the spiritually elite of Israel. They, they were from the tribe of, of Levi. Their heritage was God-given. In Old Testament times, they didn't even have their own land. They were scattered amongst all of the tribes to maintain the spiritual temperature of the nation of Israel. They'd memorised large portions of the Old Testament. Some of them even knew the Old Testament off by heart. Jeremiah 26, 3, they could say it. Lamentations 2.10, they could say it. Deuteronomy 3.4, they could say it. 
Number six said they could say they'd memorized the whole of the Old Testament. They had light laid on in terms of their life. And they knew that the scripture pointed to a coming Messiah. They had observed Jesus' life and actions and demonstration that he was the Son of God. And the question you ask yourself is, how can men who have so much light, so much truth, want to slay, want to execute, want to assassinate, want to murder Jesus. And I think that this outlines one very important principle. And that principle is this. People can move away from God regardless of how much light they receive. Can I say that again? People can move away from God regardless of how much light they receive. Uh, we, we built a house and uh, it's got a in-ground sewage system. The sewage man comes out uh, four times a year to check it out for us. We pay him a hundred bucks a visit. <laughs> and um, I got talking. He'd just been out recently. I got talking to him. Tell me a bit about his life. Tell me how... At the age of 42, he lived in Perth. Uh, he got on a bike with some of his mates and he was going to cross a large portion of desert outside of Perth. So he laden up his bike with extra petrol and all that kind of stuff and away he went. He comes flying around a corner and in front of him on the road is a soft patch of dirt. And his bike just goes, whoom, right into it. He's thrown out of his bike, straight into a barbed wire fence. And he has barbed wire wrapped around his neck and he knows nothing of it. He's out of it. He's, his head's, he's had some brain damage. They, they bring in the flying doctor service. Um, they do all kinds of things to him until eventually he recovers. With the exception of this. He turned to me and he said, you know what it was like? He, he actually used this as an illustration. He said, it's like you've got a colander like this and you put spaghetti through it so that it dangled out down here and it's like all of his life someone took some scissors and snipped away at that spaghetti at every memory that he ever had. I've, I've never, ever come across a person with amnesia. This amnesia was so severe, he still, 12 years later, cannot remember anything of his first 42 years. He, he, can't rem he couldn't remember his wife, his three kids, the company he had, none of them. In fact, he was, just after he got to know one of his mates... <laughs> He said to one of his mates, who's that ugly lady over there? And his mate said, that's your mum. <laughs> and and, it, and it, it, I thought, man, what was to be like? And then he turned to me and he said to me, I've lost my wife. I lost my company. I had to renew my relationship with my kids. I had to sell up. I live out in the outer eastern suburbs of Melbourne and moved from Perth. And my life from 42 years is gone. I cannot remember anything about it. Everything now is new. But tell me, have you ever seen that happen with a Christian? There was a time when they were on fire for God. But something has happened. And it's like... Their whole life has changed and they're unrecognisable from what they used to be. Um, you, you, you know people, maybe a brother or a sister, a friend, maybe even a former pastor or an ex-youth group buddy and they've heard truckloads of Christian, Christian truth and they maybe even taught it. But now 
they are barely recognisable as a person who knows Jesus or who knew Jesus. They're dust is there on the horizon. They're so far away from God's light. And I ask this question. Maybe you've asked the same question when you've bumped into some people. How come? How, how can this happen? I don't know, but I, I know how it started. And it started with everyone this way who slipped away from God. One unconfessed sin, one sucked on meditated evil thought. There's always a first step away from Jesus, which leads to another, to another, to another. And ultimately, intimacy with Jesus is lost. And sometimes people aren't even aware of that going on in their lives. Is it possible that you could be slipping away from Jesus and not knowing it? With David, it was one adulterous thought, uh, one adulterous look, I should say, at the naked Bathsheba. With Cain, it was one thought of consuming jealousy. With Judas, it was one offer of money. There has to be a starting point when a person starts to move away from God. And the most dangerous position that you can place yourself in is to be in a position with one undealt with, unconfessed sin, one stubborn, I won't deal with this moment. How are you going with that? Remember our principle? People can move away from God regardless of how much light they have received. And the religious leaders prove that on this first Palm Sunday. So I just get a couple of things out of this as I reflect on it. And the first is, Exposure to light doesn't guarantee sight. Um, say I take you and I take you out to the Melbourne Cricket Ground and it's in the middle of the night and we're standing there in the middle of the MCG, massive stadium, pitch black, right? And then I say to a guy up there by the power box, Flick the lights on and he turns the lights on and all the lights in the Melbourne cricket ground go on. There's not one light bulb that is broken. It's full bore light. And there you and I stand. <coughs> but you have one problem. You're blind. And if you're blind, it's not light that you need. It's sight. True? How many of us come from Christian heritage? How many of us have been exposed to bucket loads, truck loads, train loads of Christian teaching? How many of us have, have heard or read a greater por proportion of the Bible? How many of us can't even count the number of podcasts that we've listened to about Jesus? How many of us have, have lived in close proximity to people who just ooze the life of Jesus and been exposed to MCG proportions of light? The question I want to ask us and to ask you is not how much you know about Jesus, but rather how well do you know Jesus? What's the intimacy factor with you and Jesus? How real is he? You see, there's a biblical principle here, and that is exposure to light does not guarantee sight, that intimacy. And knowledge about Jesus will never replace intimacy with Jesus. And you and I can be moving away from God and stuffing our brains with more knowledge than in Wikipedia about spiritual truth and be moving away from God because we haven't got sight. We haven't dealt with 
that one unconfessed sin and it's gathered momentum. How real is Jesus to you? When was the last time you thought, man, that is an incredible answer to prayer that Jesus has given me? When was the last time you, you picked up your Bible and you're, you're opening it up and you're reading it and, and it was as if Jesus was in the room right there next to you and it leapt out at you and spoke to you? And when was the last time you had those moments when you, you're praying and you just melted in the presence of Jesus because you knew he was there? Paul says in Philippians, that I might know him. Not that I might know about him, but that I might know him. I ask myself this, is, this question, do I groan? Is there an energy within me? Is there a passion within me to know Jesus more intimately than what I currently do? I just put something in brackets here. Is it possible? that I'm talking to someone who knows all about Jesus. It's in your head, but it's never been in your heart. Um, you may have gone to some special program here that they run at Sindel where they've talked about how to come to know Jesus. You may have sat in, in many um, and heard many sermons in an audience like this and heard all about coming to know Jesus or you've looked at a person who knows Jesus and, and out of those kinds of events you've had an aha moment. Ah, that's what it's about. That's how you come to know Jesus and you have got the light but have you got sight? Has there been a time when you have set aside in your heart where you've said to Jesus, oh, Jesus, I've left you out of my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Oh, will I surrender my life to you? Will you take me as I am? Are you clay? Or are you butter? Remember, no matter how much light you've got, it's still possible to be moving away from God. Well, what you need more than anything else is, I think I've got it down here. Yep, here it is. <clears throat> is this. I don't know whether you can see that on the camera. Do you know what it is? Can you see it? It looks a bit like beach sand. could be the kind of sand that you use to mix up in concrete, but... It's not that. I've got bucket loads of this stuff at home. You know what it is? Gypsum. Because unfortunately my property has heaps of clay. <laughs> and you know what gypsum does? It breaks up the soil and makes it soft. And the gypsum that you and I need is a simple I surrender. That's the sign of a person moving towards God who has a soft heart rather than a hard heart. Well, the other thing I want to say, and with this I finish, is that I learned from this, and I love this, in fact I love this the best, <laughs> is that this whole story of Palm Sunday tells us a very important principle, and that's God's ways and not our ways. I've always struggled a bit with Palm Sunday. Let, let me tell you what it is I've struggled with. Um, at one moment, the crowd is going off its face, yelling, shouting, and screaming in euphoric mode, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. So we've got the crowd acknowledging that Jesus, it could be their deliverer. And, and their hopes are, are even beyond the planet Pluto as to what Jesus can do for them. And yet a couple of days later, there's their king 
standing before a rabid crowd, bashed and beaten up, and Pilate gives the crowd a choice. Barabbas the murderer or Jesus? Which one will you have crucified? And you know that they yelled out Barabbas and Jesus was taken away to be crucified. What I struggle with is how could some of those people who were in both crowds have changed from throwing palm leaves down to crying out Barabbas? And my conclusion is this, is that when they saw Jesus beaten and bashed, they gave up hope, Their negative circumstances caused them to lose faith in Jesus. And they just did not understand that a cross preceded by a palm tree parade was always God's intention. The, the, The change of circumstances to negative eroded their faith. I have never lived in a time like this where that challenge has been so, so evident. Where negative circumstances are so huge that the temptation for those who love Jesus is to fall into fear and to doubt because the circumstances have changed. I don't know whether you you won't be able to see this, but it's about that big. (laughs) It's a piece of a jigsaw. It's plain purple. Um, (laughs) And if I said to you, what's the picture? (laughs) You would have no idea, would you? Um, But if I go over here and hold this up, there is the picture. And so what does that teach us? This is us. We do not know the big picture in the face of the circumstances that we're in now. This is God. He has got the big picture. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus, who rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey and was crucified so that people lost their faith but eventually rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. Do you believe that he has your big picture in the negative circumstance that you face, be it the coronavirus, be it a busted marriage, be it bad results from tests, whatever it might be, do you still believe that Jesus has the big picture? Can I finish with this? I love this. I love it, I love it, I love it. Let me take you to another scene. And it's in the book of Revelation. And, And the heavens burst open, okay? And striding out of heaven, not on a donkey, but on a white horse with eyes, Revelation says, blazing crowns on his head from all the victories that he's had, a sword from his mouth, a robe dipped in blood, and behind him myriads and myriads and myriads of white horses with soldiers astride of them. And there on the side, on the thigh of Jesus is King of Kings. The same Jesus that rode a meek and mild donkey into Jerusalem on our first Palm Sunday will return again. He is King of Kings and it's he who has the final picture. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, will you grasp this? Put your faith in him. He's got your big picture as well as his church's big picture. Trust him. Don't doubt him. 
Our Father, we pray uh, that you would take our hearts and lift them towards you again. And we acknowledge again on this Palm Sunday that there will come a day when you will ride through the clouds and return for us as King of Kings. Enable us to uphold our faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.